hoping that through the summer, but uh, Paul's just a faithful guy. I love him. Uh, just love him to death. So, uh, Paul, if you'll come and, and preach this morning to us. Thanks, brother. Thanks, Pastor. Thanks, Troy and the worship team. That was beautiful singing. Blessed assurance is always good to sing. I was um, downstairs this morning looking at my notes for this morning, and my, um, my granddaughter walked over to me, and she said, Grandpa, what are you doing? And I said, well, honey, I'm studying my notes. And she goes, and then we started down the why path. She said, well, why? I said, because I'm preaching today. She goes, why are you preaching? I said, because the pastor asked me to. Well, why did the pastor ask you to? I said, because he needed a break. Why does he need a break? I said, well, honey, he's tired. Well, why is he tired? I, honey, he just needs a break. So she sat there for a second, and she looked across at her dad, and she went, Daddy, how about I preach? And she dragged her little brother up on the hearth of our fireplace downstairs, and we were her congregation. And I looked at my son and said, boy, you got a lot of work to do, my friend. Oh, goodness. Uh, it has nothing to do with this message. It was, I just thought it was cute. Anyway, <laughs> we're in Genesis chapter 22. God gave us pictures, types, and prophecies in the Old Testament of that which was to come in the New Testament. Why, why would God do that? Why did he do that? Well, for one reason, he gave us, he, he was, it gave us a great confirmation of the inspiration of Scripture, like 2 Timothy 3.16 tells us. We can rest assured that God's Word is true, and God uses the Old Testament to confirm that. We can look back thousands of years before the birth of our Savior and see God's pictures, types, and prophecies of Him. Not only are these pictures and prophecies a confirmation of Scripture, but they are also the confirmation of the deity of our Lord Jesus Christ. Those pictures and types are tucked away in the Word of God for us to find, for us to find and read. This is why we're going through this study, the anticipation of the King. The Old and New Testament all point to one person, and that's Jesus. That's why Jesus could say in Luke 24, 27, that in beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. He didn't talk about Abraham. He didn't talk about Isaac. He didn't talk about Moses or Elijah or Elisha, Daniel or anybody else. He, he expounded the scripture concerning himself because it all points to him. I've heard it said that the Old Testament is our, is our Messiah concealed and the New Testament is our Messiah revealed. In Genesis chapter 22, we're going to see that. We're going to see another picture of our coming king. So let's go to, uh, if you have your Bibles, turn to Genesis chapter 22 and verse number 21. Let's get started. And it came to pass after these things. Now stop. I told you we were going to get started, but I didn't say how far we were going to go. After all these things, that should, that should, that should gender a question in us to say, well, what things? Well, all the things that God used in Abraham's life to bring him to this point. Our brother Troy preached last week about the confirmation and the ratification of the Abrahamic covenant that God did with Abraham in Genesis chapter 15. He also touched on the beginning part of chapter 15, where God came to, take, came to Abraham in a vision and said, I am thy shield and I am thy great exceeding reward. Well, Abraham responded to that by saying, well, Lord, what do you give me considering I have no child? I do have Eliezer, my steward. And God says, nope, that's not going to work. In verse number four, God says, this shall be thine heir, but he, he, this shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. He said, Abraham, the heir of your covenant is going to come from you. It's not going to be your steward. It's going to come from you. Well, apparently... By the, end of, by the start of chapter 16, Sarai and Abram realized that maybe God needed some help. So Sarai gave Abraham, Abram Hagar and said, you know, I'm too old for this, Abram. Take my handmaid, Hagar. So Abram does. Well, we know how that worked out. 
By the end of chapter 16, you see that, that Abraham was a- Abram was 86 years old. So I keep thinking about Troy going, say Abram, not Abraham yet. He was 86 years old when, when Ishmael was born. In chapter 17, God comes to Abram and changes his name from exalted father to Abraham, father of a multitude or father of nations. He reiterated the covenant and established circumcision as the sign of that covenant. But God did something more this time than he did in chapter 15. He also changed Sarai's name. In verse number 16, he changed her name from Sarai, princess, or my princess, to Sarah, noble woman or princess of a multitude or nations. It's different than chapter 15 because this time God included Sarah. Why did he do that? Because he knew what Abraham was going to say. Because right after he does that, in verse 18, he says, oh, may Ishmael live before thee. And and God said, "Uh, no. In verse number 19 and 21, he said, your heir is going to come through you and Sarah. God made it very specific. And we do think about Sarah uh, laughing in, in Genesis 18. Don't forget, Abraham laughed in Genesis 17. And for the same reason, uh, Lord, we're old. And at this time, uh, Abraham was 99, which made Sarah 89. In chapter 18, in the plains of Mamre, the Lord comes and two angels come to Abraham and tell him what he's going to do with Sodom. At the same time, he says, I will visit Sarah this time next year and you'll have a child. Well, that's where she heard it. But the scripture uh, tells us that... um, it says that they were both old, and Sarah was past the years of, having, of being able to have a child. That's why she laughed. So, But God was going to establish their heir through Sarah. God went on to tell Abraham what he was going to do to Sodom. Abraham bargained with God from 45 down to 10 to try and save Sodom because his nephew was there. And God even agreed to that, but it still didn't save Sodom. God, and then in chapter 20, Abraham and Sarah erred again. They went south into the land of Philistines, and for a second time, Abraham uh, lied about his wife to Abimelech. So, in, at the end of chapter 20, or in the beginning of chapter 21, the Bible tells us that finally, finally, God kept his word. A year later, he came back to Sarah. After 25 years, Isaac was finally born. After, the, after he was weaned, Abraham had a great feast. And Ishmael mocked Isaac, and, and, and Sarah saw it. And the New Testament uh, illustrates that a little bit better. In Galatians 4.29, it says, He that was born after the flesh persecuted him born after the spirit. Sarah told Abraham to cast out Hagar and Ishmael. Get him out. I don't want him here. Well, of course... Abraham was upset. He was grieved, the Bible says. Why? Because Ishmael was his son. But God came to Abraham and said, no, do it. Listen to your wife and do it because the heir will come through Isaac. In verse, in, in verse number 12 of, of chapter 21, he says, for in Isaac shall thy seed be called. At the end of chapter 21, um, Abraham makes a covenant with Abimelech uh, and they become friends. He, he disputes Abimelech over a, a, a well, and he gets it back, and he names it Beersheba. So you get to chapter 22, and Abraham probably thought, oh, man, whew, man, after all this time, after all this struggle, after all, the, all this stuff, I'm, I'm on easy street. I got it made. Well, and then we go back to ch- uh, chapter 22 and verse 1. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. God, the Bible tells us that God tempted Abraham. This isn't a, tempt, uh, a temptation to sin but a test to strengthen him. James 1.13 makes it very plain that God doesn't do that. 
Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But God does tell us where it comes from. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. So God didn't tempt Abraham to sin, but he tested him. It, the, the, the Hebrew word, word means to try, prove the quality of one's strength. And that's what God was going to do. So what does this mean? Well, I just read to you James 1, 13 and 14, but James 1, 12 says, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life. You know, just up earlier in that very same chapter of James, he says, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Knowing this, that the trial of your faith worketh patience. Paul said the same thing. In Romans chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, he said, And not only so, but we glory in tribulations, knowing that, that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope, and hope maketh not ashamed. For the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given to us. Paul says that these tribulations strengthen us. It builds endurance, patience. It builds character, experience, and it builds hope, that earnest expectation that we know that what God said is true. And that hope will never make us ashamed. We will never be ashamed of our Savior because of what he's given us. 1 Peter 1.7 also tells us the trial of our faith because we're going to go through trials. He tells them in verse number 6, though if need be for a season you're in heaviness through manifold temptations. But he says that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold which perish, perisheth, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Our trials, our tribulations strengthen us. And that's what God was going to do to Abraham. And this was a doozy. This was a doozy test. A faith that can't be tested can't be trusted. And Abraham was going to see that. This is a unique story in God's redemptive history, and it was done for a very specific reason. It's a beautiful picture of our coming king and what he would do for us. So the character, there are two characters, but the character we're focusing on today is Isaac. Why? Because Isaac is a picture of our Lord Jesus Christ. And how's, how is that? There are several ways that, they, that, that you can compare the two. First of all, there was a miracle birth prophesied. In Genesis chapter 18, verses 10 and 11, God says, and he said, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life, and lo, Sarah thy wife shall have a son. And Sarah heard it in the tent of the door which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old and well stricken in age, and it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of, of women. That was a miracle. Sarah couldn't have a baby. And Abraham was really old, and there was no way that, that biologically, biologically they were going to have a child. How about our Savior? Isaiah 7, 14 says, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Now, we don't have to wonder about this, because Mary herself confirmed her virginity in Luke chapter 1, verse 34, and an angel also confirmed it to Joseph in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 20. And I might stop here for a deity alert. In Matthew chapter 1 and verse number 20, we, he, he, uh, he says that this thing that's conceived in Mary it was conceived by the Holy Ghost. But in verse numbers 22 and 23, the Bible says, Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord, of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. The Bible made it very plain that everybody understood that what was happening to Mary was the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy, and it was God with us. Not only was a miracle birth prophesied in Isaac and in our Savior, the name was divinely given. There are eight boys named by, by divine inspiration. God named five of eight little boys. One of them was Isaac. In Genesis chapter 17, verse 19, and God said, Sarah thy wife shall bear thee a son indeed, and thou shalt call his name Isaac. 
And we just talked about Matthew chapter 20, verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 20, and 22 and 23. But what about verse 21 in between those verses? Uh, verse 21 um, tells us that it says that uh, you shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Jesus was the eighth and last and far separate from the other ones. But he, they were both divinely named. Not only that, but there was a love of the Father that was for his only Son. In Genesis chapter 22 and verse 2, we just read it. He said, and he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. He said, thine only son, Isaac. He tells it, it, and you might say, well, wait a minute. You know, if Jesus was walking on the road to Emmaus with, this, with, the two, with this, the, these disciples, they might say, well, hold on, Lord, um, or hold on, mister. They didn't know him yet. Uh, Isaac wasn't Abraham's only son. Well, he was, according to the covenant. He was a, the only son through Sarah, and that's what they're talking about here. Um, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17, it tells it a little plainer. It says, By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. The Greek word there for that phrase, only begotten son, is, mon is monogenes, which means pertaining to being the only one of its kind, and it can be within a specific relationship, which it was, Isaac was in the specific relationship between Abraham and Sarah. So it was the love of the Father. It was the first time love is found in the Bible, by the way, in that verse in Genesis 22, 2. But what about our Savior? In John chapter 3, verse 35, Jesus says, The Father loveth the Son and hath given all things into his hand. He says the exact same thing in John chapter 5, verse 20. The Father loved the Son. We hear God speak from heaven on a couple different occasions at Jesus' baptism and also on the Mount of Transfiguration in Matthew 17. What does God say in both those times? He says, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. The Father loved the Son, and the Father and the Son was the only begotten of the Father. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 9, it says, and this was manifest in, in this was manifested the love of God toward us because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Only begotten son there is the exact same Greek word used in Hebrews eleven seventeen 17 for Isaac, monogenes, pertaining to being the only one of its kind or class, and this time unique in kind. Just like you've heard Pastor Carl say before, he was one of a kind. And that gave, that gave our Lord Jesus Christ every right to say in John 10, 30, I and my Father are one. It gave Paul every right in Philippians chapter 2 and in verse number 6 to say uh, that, that um, um, I just forgot it. I usually don't, but I just forgot it. Oh, being found in the, form of, uh, in, the, in, the fact, in the form of God, he did not think it was robbery to be equal with God. Jesus knew he was the, fa the son of the Father, and he was one of a kind. Well, so was Isaac. Not only that, but they were also both raised from the dead. Look at, look at chapter 22 and verses 3 and 4. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and clave the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went unto the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. <clears throat> oh, take number two. They were both raised from the dead. You might say, well, Isaac didn't die. What do you mean by that? Well, it says in verse number 3, that on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. How was this a resurrection? Well, Hebrews 19 gives us a, a clue on it. In, in verse number 19 of Hebrews 11, it says, Accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, 
from whence also he received him in a figure. That word figure there is the Greek word parabole, and it means a placing of one thing by the side of another, an example by which a doctrine or precept is illustrated. In the New Testament, this word is translated 46 times as the word parable, earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And folks, that's what this is. This is absolutely an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. After three days of travel, travel in Abraham's eyes, Isaac was dead already. Isaac had already been sacrificed. Abraham was just going to complete it when they got to the place. What about our Lord Jesus Christ? Well, folks, the resurrection is, 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 the, is the bedrock, the foundation of, of the gospel. In 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4, it says, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. That The Greek word for he rose again there in verse number 4 of 1 Corinthians 15 is the same Greek word that is found in Hebrews eleven nineteen, where it says to raise him up. It was the same picture, but it was only in a figure. It was figurative. It was a picture of what was coming. But the Scripture tells us that both, that both were raised from the dead. And not only were the similarities there, but the similarities of the place. This, not only was a special person described, we talked about Isaac, we talked about our Savior, but there was a special place designated. Back in chapter 22 again, verses 2 through 4, you see in verse number 2, he says, Get thee into the land of Moriah. In verse number 4, it says, Then on the third day Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. You know, the, the, our, our planet, our solar system is in the Milky Way. Astronomers tell us, they estimate that the Milky Way is 170,000 to 200,000 light years in diameter and 1,000 light years thick. They approximate, uh, they approximate about 400 billion stars and planets. Now, that one little piece of the universe, out of all those billions and billions of planets, God looked down and chose earth. And God looked at the earth, he looked all around the earth, and he came to a spot, a little sliver on the Mediterranean Sea, and he chose that place. It was Israel. Then God looked throughout all of Israel, and he looked the length and the breadth of it, and he, and he chose one little city, Jerusalem. And he looked all through the land of Jerusalem. He looked all around the city. And right outside the city, he chose one little hill. One little hill. And that one spot was going to be the center of the universe. I've always said before, I've said in my Sunday school class, that once the sin happened in the Garden of Eden, mankind started trudging up the hill of sin. We tr- and we tr- all trudged through history till we got to the pinnacle of history, and what was there? Moriah, Calvary. God chose this one hill. Moriah means for seen of the Lord. This place was not incidental. It was not accidental. There was a reason God had this specific place in mind. The hill of Moriah, or Mount Moriah, was a very busy piece of real estate. We see it appear again in 2 Chronicles chapter 3 and verse 1. It says, Then Solomon began to build the house of the Lord at Jerusalem in Mount Moriah, where the Lord appeared unto David his father in the place that David had prepared in the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. That very same piece of land that Solomon built the temple was the same place that David bought from Ornan the Jebusite or Aruna in 2 Samuel 24. But in 1 Chronicles chapter 21, you can go back and read the story of David's sin by numbering the people, and God gave him a choice, and he decided to be in God's hand. And God, and God started executing his judgment. And David went and bought this threshing floor off of Ornan, took his ox, and sacrificed to the Lord to stay the Lord's hand in judgment. That's, this is the same place. 
and God chose it. God said, Abraham, I want you to go three days out. And when we got to the third day, God said, right there. I want you to go right there, Abraham. I don't want you to go over here. This spot is on the road isn't good enough. I want you to go right over there to that hill. God chose it for a reason. Many scholars believe that this is the same mountain where where our Lord Jesus Christ was crucified. In Luke chapter 23, verse 33, it says that when they they were come to the place, which is called Calvary. These scholars believe that, that Moriah extends past where the temple was built and very easily could have been the same mount upon which Jesus was crucified. God was very specific on the place where Abraham was to go. There there had to be a reason for it, and with what this story pictures, I think they're the exact same place. God doesn't make mistakes. God was very exact in what he was doing. And not only was the place very exact, the purpose or the reason was very exact. It was sacrifice. Genesis chapter 22, verses 5 through 10, and Abraham said unto his young men, abide ye here with the ass. And I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife. And they went both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father. And he said, "Here, here Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold, the fire and the wood... But where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. And they came to the place which God had told him of. And Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. Now with the sacrifice at hand, the father and the son came to a point beyond which nobody else was to go. He says there in in that passage passage we just read, he said to his young men, abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. He said, you guys stay here. Isaac and I are going to go on by ourselves. Isaac could see the knife. He could see the fire. Isaac could also sense what was happening. He looked around and said, hey, Dad, I don't see anything. I don't see anything for a sacrifice. That only leaves me. He knew what was going on. Just think of what Abraham must have felt for those three days because of, of, of what was about to happen. Our Lord Jesus Christ... Well, he, we, don't have to, we don't have to wonder why he came. He told us. In Mark chapter 10, verse 45, he said, For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered to, but to minister and give his life a ransom for many. In Luke 19, 10, he said, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Hebrews tells us in chapter 9, of, in verse 26, But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away the sin by the sacrifice of himself. Jesus came for one reason, folks. I mean, we can, we're going to read all through the, the Gospels and, and, and see the life of our Savior. We're going to learn so much. He gave us the perfect example on how to live. But make no mistake about it, our Savior came for one reason, and one reason alone, and that was to be our sacrifice. The Son, also went, the, the, the Son of God also went where nobody else could go. In in Gethsemane, in in Matthew chapter 26, verses 36 through 44, Jesus and his disciples get to Gethsemane. He he says, you guys stay here. He took Peter, James, and John with him and went a little farther in. And then he told those guys, you stay here. And the Bible tells us that three times our Savior went off by himself to commune with the Father. It was just the Father and the Son. Also, I think about the day of the crucifixion. The last three hours of it, it grew very dark. It was like a veil was drawn across the world in sadness and shame. The world was left on the outside, and the transaction for the payment of our sins 
was between the Father and the Son. It was a place where only the Father and the Son could go. Also about the sacrifice, it was also made willingly. In, in Isaac's case, in Genesis chapter 22, in verse 9, it says, Abraham built an altar there, laid the wood in order, bound Isaac his son, and laid him on the altar of wood. You got to remember at this point, folks, remember, how old was Abraham when Isaac was born? A hundred. Now, how old was Isaac? We don't know for sure, but he certainly wasn't a small child. Of every commentator, every everyone that I could possibly read, the youngest was 18 and the oldest was 33. In Genesis chapter 23 and verse number 1, the Bible tells us that Sarah died. She was 127 years old. That meant Isaac was 37. Also, we'll see here in a minute, there was another reason why most believe that Isaac was not a young man. Isaac could, have, Isaac could have looked at the situation and said, hmm, I'm 30, my dad's 130, I think I can outrun him. I think I can, I think I can overpower him. Hey, dad, not today. That's not happening today. But he didn't. He willingly submitted himself to his father's will. Our Lord Jesus Christ in John chapter 10, verses 17 and 18, he says, Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. Jesus said, nobody's taking me. Nobody's killing me. When he stood before Pilate in John chapter 18, Pilate says, hey, come on, answer me. Don't you know I have the power to crucify you or release you? And Jesus said, you've got no power at all unless it was given to you by the Father. That's why Paul told the Philippians in chapter 2 and verse number 8, it says, and being found in fashion as a man, our Savior, he humbled himself. He became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Our Lord Jesus Christ came to die for our sins. He came to be our sacrifice, but he came to do his Father's will. And this was his Father's will. Read John chapter 6. You'll know exactly what God's will was. God the Father's will was for everybody to be saved and trust in his Son. And Jesus said, I came down from heaven not to do my, my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. Isaac and, G and Jesus both did the will of their fathers. Lastly, Isaac walked up the hill carrying his own wood to his own sacrifice. The Bible tells us here in Genesis chapter 22 that he took the wood for the burnt offering in verse number 6 and laid it upon Isaac, his son. In John chapter 19 and verse number 17, the Bible says, And he, Jesus, bearing his cross, went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which called in the Hebrew Golgotha. So up until this time, we see similarity after similarity between Isaac and our Savior. God did that on purpose, folks. And he wanted us to understand what was coming. This was a picture of our king. But the story doesn't end there. I mean, I, Abraham did exactly what God told him to do. I didn't bring it up at the time, but in verse number 3, he says, And Abraham rose up early in the morning. So God says, Okay, Abraham, I want you to go sacrifice your son. He didn't bargain. He didn't say, Oh, what am I going to do? Boy, Sarah's going to kill me if she finds out about this. He didn't, he didn't hem-haw around. He got up early the next morning and took off. There was trust there. There was faith there. Abraham was ready to complete the sacrifice of his son, but now suddenly the picture changes in verse number 11 of, of 22. And the angel of the Lord, now remember, Abraham's like this. He's ready to slay his own son. And in verse number 11, it says, And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, 
Neither do, any, do, do thou anything unto him, for now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah-Jireh, as, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. Isaac didn't die that day. Suddenly, the picture changes. Isaac's been a representation or a picture of our Lord Jesus Christ, but now the picture switches, and Isaac becomes a picture of us. And who becomes the picture of our Savior? The ram. The ram with his horns caught in a thicket. A ram with a crown of thorns became Isaac's substitute. Isaac got off the altar, and the lamb was slain in his place. Isaac didn't die that day. The ram took his place. Abraham believed that God would be able to raise Isaac from the dead. So people may ask, well, then why didn't God do it? Why didn't God let him go ahead and kill him to slay his own son? First of all, our God's not like the pagan gods. He doesn't need a a, a human sacrifice. But more importantly than that, this, that wasn't the picture that God wanted to give to us. Why? Isaac couldn't actually die for anybody. The shed blood of Isaac would do nothing for me. It would do nothing for you. It would do nothing for Abraham. Folks, Isaac needed a Savior too. So the ram became Isaac's substitute. Genesis chapter 22 and verse number 7, Isaac asked his father where the sacrifice was, and Abraham's answer was, my son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. That's right. God did exactly what Abraham said he would do. He provided a sacrifice. And then if you look, if you fast forward 2,000 years into the future from this very event, God did it again. In Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 and 5, it says, But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Abraham saw that the ram was, was to take the place of Isaac. God gave Abraham back his son, as it were, from the dead. Abraham named that place Jehovah Jireh. The Lord will provide. The Lord certainly provided for Abraham that day. And folks, he did the same thing for us today. He provided the same lamb. That was why John the Baptist could look at Jesus when he came up in John chapter 1, verse 29, and said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Do you think maybe Abraham looked down through there and saw that? Do you think Abraham used the word lamb by mistake? Of course he didn't. He looked down through the corridors of time and saw what our Lord Jesus Christ would one day do for us. Is it any wonder then why Jesus said in John 8, 56, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day and he saw it and was glad? Don't you think Abraham was glad? He didn't have to kill a son. I'd be glad. I'd rejoice at that. Abraham did see Jesus' day. I think he saw it right here. And Jesus told the guys that he was talking to, he was talking to the Pharisees, he said, your father Abraham loved to see my day. He rejoiced when he saw it, and he was glad. Not only was his son returned to him, but but Abraham was able to look down through the corridors of time and see that the Lamb of God was one day going to be the substitute for all of us. And for us, what are we doing here? We're here to look at, we're anticipating our king. We got to see through this story in Genesis chapter 22 that our king was coming. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time together in your word. Father, I thank you for this beautiful picture that we have. Lord, you asked Abraham to do something that he, I'm sure he did not understand. I'm sure he didn't, he didn't get it. 
But what we do understand was that he trusted you. He didn't know how it was all going to work out, but through the faithfulness of, of, of Abraham and the faithfulness of Isaac, we get to see not only a beautiful picture of God, uh, of God providing for Abraham and Isaac, but through the, through the picture of a parable, got to see the substitutionary death of our 